Yeah, I am the I am the community outreach specialist for the um, Hispanic community here in San Francisco and in East Bay. Um, next slide, please. And I wanted just to get started by sharing a little bit about our mission. Um, the Austin Heart Association is actually a wor worldwide voluntarily health organization. We dedicate ourselves to Alzheimer's care, support, and research as well. And our mission really is to lead the way to end the Alzheimer's and all other dementia. Um, just yesterday during our volunteer um, festivities at the office, I learned that only two entities actually do more research than ourselves, and that is the US government and the Chinese government. So that's how big we are in research for Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, we do all of this by accelerating global research, driving risk reduction and early detection efforts, and also by maximizing quality care and support through our education programs and such. And then before we start diving a little bit more about who we are and what we do, I did want to make sure that we're all on the same page with some important definitions. Um, so there's actually different types of dementia. Dementia is just a general term for loss of memory, language, problem solving, and other thinking abilities that are severe enough to interfere with daily life. That's the key. These things interfere with daily life. But Alzheimer's is actually the most common cause of dementia. Um, dementia is not a single disease. It's an overall term. That's why we have the umbrella right here. It's like heart disease. It's just an umbrella term. Um, this covers a wide range of specific medical conditions, including Alzheimer's disease and disorders grouped under the general term dementia are caused by abnormal brain changes. These changes trigger a decline in thinking skills, also known as cognitive abilities, um, severe enough to impair daily life and independent function. And they also affect behavior, feelings, and ultimated relationships. Alzheimer's disease accounts for 60 to 80% of all cases. And then it's followed by vascular dementia, which occurs because of microscopic bleeding and blood vessels blockage in the brain. And this is the second most common cause of dementia. And those who experience the brain changes of multiple types of dementia simultaneously actually have what's called mixed dementia. And there are many other conditions that can cause symptoms of dementia, including some that are reversible, such as thyroid problems and vitamin deficiencies. Um, you may also have heard the term senility or senile dementia, which is what many people formerly call dementia. But now we know that it, there's different types of dementia. So before there was a commonly accepted belief that serious mental decline was normal part of aging. And now we know that that is not true. Science knows that there are multiple case, causes of dementia and they have many different symptoms, which include problems with short-term memory, keeping track of a purse or a wallet or paying bills, planning and preparing meals and such. But oftentimes, dementia will start out slowly and gradually get worse. If you or someone you know is experiencing memory difficulties, uh, changes in thinking abilities, don't ignore them because they are not part of normal aging. Um, so we always recommend seeing a doctor to determine the cause. Um, and then I also wanted to just show you all a little bit about the recent um, facts and figures that was released just last month. Um, as you can see, one in three seniors dies with Alzheimer's or another dementia. Um, all these have been released just a few days ago. And one that actually is not on here, but it is in our uh, flyer, is that the lifetime risk for Alzheimer's at age 45, just age 45, is one out of five for, men, for women and one out of 10 for men. Um, before we used to think, think that dementia would only happen in elderly, but now we're seeing more and more individuals um, that are younger with uh, mild cognitive impairment or early signs of Alzheimer's or dementia. 
and then I'm going to pass on the mic to my colleague Erica to talk a little bit about our work in DEI. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks, Daniela, for kicking us off. My name is Erica. I'm the African American Community Outreach Specialist here at the association. Um, and I focus my work in the East Bay and in San Mateo and in other Black communities throughout the Bay Area. Um, so we're talking about reaching all communities and the importance of DEI in our work. And at the association, we believe that diverse perspectives are really critical to what we do here, which is achieving health equity. Um, and that means that all communities have a fair and just opportunity for early diagnosis, access to risk reduction and quality care. Um, we're committed here at the association to engaging underrepresented and underserved communities and responding with resources uh, and education to address the disproportionate impact that Alzheimer's disease can have. Um, and we're gonna start talking about what that looks like for each community. Um, so feel free to write your questions down and, ask, and hopefully pay attention to uh, how this disease manifests itself into um, the different communities that we serve here in the Bay Area and in Northern California. So we're gonna start by talking about women. Um, we saw in the stats earlier that one out of five women um, above the age 45 are at risk of Alzheimer's, one out of 10 for um, men. So actually almost two thirds of Americans living, living right now with Alzheimer's are women. Um, in the US, more than 10 million women are either living with Alzheimer's or caring for someone who has it. And over 60% of all Alzheimer's and dementia caregivers are women. Um, so we can see just like the difference of how this is affecting us women more than men. Um, and then back to Erica. Uh, so Alzheimer's disease affects the Black community in a really unique way. Uh, Black Amer Americans are about two times as likely to have Alzheimer's than white Americans and other uh, dementias, and they're less likely to receive a diagnosis in time um, before it reaches a later stage. Uh, we know that from our uh, facts and figures from last year, that 20% say that they have uh, no barriers or excellent health care to support Alzheimer's. Um, and then about half say that uh, they've experienced discrimination when seeking care. Uh, in general, but also in uh, specifically when they're seeking care for Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, I think that there's a unique intersection that we'll be diving into next week at our African American Male Community Engagement Forum, um, which we'll be talking about the specific barriers that our men have with reaching and accessing the right care. Good morning, everyone. So I'm Benson Zhao. I'm the community engagement manager and focus uh, in San Francisco and the East Bay area. My community is the Chinese American and all other AAPI communities as well. So I just want to share a little bit about uh, our Native Americans and the Alzheimer's disease. So compared with uh, the white peers, uh, Native Americans are more likely to develop this disease. Is uh, as many as in one of three will develop Alzheimer's or another dementia in their lifetime. And uh, more than 60% say their affordability is a care, affordability of care is a barrier. In other words, they cannot afford a quality care once, the, once this disease is being affected the families. And actually by the 2060, we predict the number of uh, American India and Alaska Native individuals 65 and older living with the dementia is projected to increase fourfold. Next. Hi, everyone. My name is Katya, and I'm our LGBTQ community outreach specialist based out of San Francisco. Um, and I also work in San Mateo counties here in Northern California. 
Um, so we know that age is the greatest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, and there's an estimated 2.7 million LGBT people um, over the age of 50. So we are a fast um, growing aging population. Um, and we face some unique challenges um, related to dementia care um, and Alzheimer's. Uh, so we know that 7.4% of lesbian, gay, and bisexual older adults are living with dementia. Uh, we don't have very much um, data or evidence on the transgender community. Um, many trans folks um, have a lack of trust with the healthcare system. So we're working um, to reduce some of those barriers and build trust in communities. One of the other challenges you see listed here is up to 30% um, of our community experience lower rates of access to care. Um, and again, that is due to fear from discrimination from healthcare providers. So we have a program here in San Francisco um, where we provide cultural humility, LGBTQ cultural humility trainings to health providers to make sure that everyone um, feels safe accessing care, especially in long-term care settings and that no one feels the need to go back in the closet. Um, also listed here, 40% of LGBTQ folks report that their support networks have become smaller over time. Um, not everyone, but many uh, people face rejection from their families or estrangement from their biological families. Um, they're maybe less likely to have biological children. We know marriage equality wasn't legal until 2015 in America. So um, our older LGBTQ community has a lot of uh, complex needs um, related to caregiving for this disease. And 34% report living alone. So these are some of the issues um, in our community that we're working to address. Thanks everyone. You're on mute, Benson. Hi, um, um, this is Xiaoyong and um, I just see, um, can just, uh, is it, am I supposed to talk or is it Benson to talk? I'm not sure. Go, Go ahead, ahead Xiaoyong. Um, so you're on since. Go ahead, please. Okay. Um, so um, it's for the Asian American and Pacific Islander and Alzheimer's disease. And I'm uh, here in the Alzheimer's Association as I'm the uh, community uh, engagement manager. So we cover AAPI um, communities all throughout the chapter areas and also beyond. And I want to talk about, like, we know that 46% of Asian Americans say they are concerned about developing the disease, uh, Alzheimer or related dementia. And, but uh, 56 uh, believe that the significant loss of memory or uh, cognitive uh, ability is normal part of aging. So they didn't know there's any um, need to go to see a doctor or, or talk to that doctor. And, there's a 45% believe medical research is biased and, and get against people of color. So we have the need to, you know, do more community education to um, let people know about um, Alzheimer's and dementia and also know there's a lot of like um, resources available to help them. And lastly, but not least, we have our Hispanic American community. Um, this community is known to be about 1.5 times as likely as white Americans to have Alzheimer's and other dementias. Um, one third report that they have experienced discrimination when seeking health care. And 57% believe that a significant loss of memory or cognitive abilities is part of normal aging. So whenever I've been out in the community, um, I have had to talk about how this is not a part of normal aging, um, they bust some of the myths that still live and are very deeply rooted in this community, and how it's still a taboo topic, um, which is why we ask from all of you to volunteer to help us create awareness about this disease and all of that. Go ahead, Erica. 
Thank you um, all for just sharing more about the hurdles that our different communities face. Um, so this is just to wrap all of that up by saying, you know, our communities have a variety of different hurdles. Um, we know that including uh, uh, stress and racism and discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and other uh, parts that make us human um, can actively uh, age the brain and can lead to higher rates of cognitive decline in diverse communities. We know that depression and heart disease and hypertension are already rampant in many of the communities that we are talking about, which can help or, or also to increase the amount of cognitive decline that can happen over someone's lifetime. Um, and with that, 6 million Americans live with this disease, but it's important for us to take a second to know how this affects um, people from different intersections and walks of life. Um, so thank you for, for listening to what we're doing to hopefully help these communities reach the services that we provide. Um, and now we get to talk about how you can help us in that journey. Yes, so we know that the aging of our population means that an unprecedented and growing number of people will require care and support for living with dementia. And usually the most difficult challenge that many families, this is the most difficult challenge that many families will have to face, um, finding the support and the care to care for their um, loved ones. And too few of them have the information and the resources that they actually need to live their best possible life and plan for a better tomorrow. Um, so as you can see, you can help us realize our vision of a world without Alzheimer's and a lot of dementia. The association does have a variety of volunteer opportunities that we'll be talking about in just a second. Um, but you can join us as an individual, as an organization, club, business, and also just it's for you and for your family. You know, we have all these resources, our 24-7 helpline. It's available to all of you. We have more information on our website, which is right here. Um, and we just ultimately want you to know that we provide education, support, and caregiving resources. And now I want to talk a little bit about what our volunteers have had to say on their experience with being here with the Alzheimer's Association. Um, these are just some quotes that some have said and shared throughout their experience at the association. Um, again, I want to volunteer for respected organizations with high impact. I want to pay forward for services that I receive um, from the Alzheimer's Association. And there's a few more. You know, I hate this disease so much. I need to do something about it. And that's often the drive that a lot of our volunteers have, that they have a personal relationship with this disease and they want to do something about it because at times they can just feel so helpless to be in this disease and perhaps you're feeling like you're alone in this and that there's no support, there's no resources. And it's just the fact that a lot of the times we don't know about the resources. We don't know that these exist and that we're here and that everything that we provide is free. Um, is Patricia with us? I want she to is. I think she just got here. <laughs> Our, our um, one of our LGBTQ outreach interns, Patricia Duongchum, um, was gonna maybe share a little bit about her experience for any um, of you prospective volunteers or even if anyone's interested in interning as well. So thanks for joining Patricia. Oh, see you're Hi. on <laughs> Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Patricia. So I volunteer since October. I found the Alzheimer's Association on the volunteermat.org. And after that, with uh, Katia called me and talking about the hour responsible, and it's like, oh, it is really mad with me because I'm interested to be the uh, committee outreach, interested about the activity field. And after that, uh, with she tried she asking about uh, what is my uh, 
how many days that I would like to work or something like that. And she tied to match with our availability. So I think if you don't worry that how many hours that you want to help us or maybe support us, I think we can find a, something like that after that. And uh, for the Alzheimer's association, I think it's not only that I learn a lot about the Alzheimer's dementia, but I also really happy when I meet a uh, DI team that they are always welcome. They listen, open my listen or uh, my opinion, hiding and sometimes I had a question that they cannot answer by themselves. They they try to uh, have appointment with the other professional or maybe try to looking forward to uh what is uh is good answer or help each other is in a good way. So after I've been here for almost four months, six months, something like that. And I think it's, I'm really happy and really enjoy. And yeah, it's really good opportunity to not only for learn about our lessons, but also to communicate, uh, engagement with the community. And yeah, and I got a positive vibe a lot when I work with the IT. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Patricia, for sharing your experience. We're so lucky to have you with us. So appreciate that. Thanks. All right. Um, I'll hand it back over to Danny now. I think we're gonna talk a little bit more about oh. yes. I, <laughs> I thought I froze. Um <laughs> talk a little bit more about how to actually get started with an application and what the process looks like. Yes, so um, the first step to the application process is actually going to our website. All of our application process um, takes place online. Um, so if you go to alz.org slash norca slash volunteer, it actually takes you to our webpage. Um, Erica, can I start sharing? So I can show what that looks like. So this is our web page. It will take you here. Um, and as you can see, there's just a lot of information. Volunteering, apply now will open up this Google form um, that you will have to fill out. We'll talk a little bit about the process in a few minutes. Um, you can look at our different programs, walk to end Alzheimer's, advocacy, you know, there's all of this. Um, but I did want to talk about the two most, um, I guess, volunteers that we have. Um, and that would be the, um, let me go back to start sharing. It will be the community representative and community um, educator. So actually the community representative engages um, to raise awareness about the Alzheimer's Association. So this is more like doing table and events or at health fairs, um, going to um, just community events, organization events, clubs. And the community educator in, on the other hand is actually someone who uh, does more public speaking because they engage more in providing a lot of our education programs to community audiences. So these are the two um, most um, needed volunteers that we have right now, but there is cross collaboration that is always, always happening. Um, and now for the uh, um, advocacy day, we also need volunteers. There's the walk to end Alzheimer's, which is our biggest fundraising event. We also have the longest day coming up in June. Um, and if we go to our actual um, PVC and look at all the ro role descriptions, we can also see that we have um, data entry volunteers, tech support volunteers, uh, faith outreach representatives, early stage leaders. So there's just a lot of um, positions, not just community representative, not just community educator, um, you can volunteer in whichever position you want, um, but this is just to talk a little bit about what we have, and I know Erica and Katya want to talk a little bit more about what they're personally planning and needing for 
Let me stop sharing. I'll hand it over to Erica. Go ahead, Erica. Yes, yeah, so um, I am looking for an African American uh, medical and outreach intern for the summer and fall semester. Um, this is a really great opportunity to engage with our faith based communities, as well as some of our more um, diverse outreach that we do within the East Bay and San Mateo um, and in our small but mighty community in Santa Clara County. Um, so I would absolutely love if you have any interest with working with the Black community here in the Bay Area, reach out to me directly and we can talk more about what that role looks like and um, what are the, the particular hours, all of those specific specifications. Awesome. And I just um, wanted to quickly say that I think I had someone, um, one of our applicants on volunteer match for our data entry uh, role as well. Um, so I could say a little bit about that, but um, we have a software system, a CRM called Personify, um, and we have a pretty um, thorough online training um, that you would be able to take. We train and onboard you online first, and then you'd be able to work with us um, in one of our offices to continue your training um, and to actually enter the data. You'd be able, um, hopefully you'd be able to join us in the office. I think it's an in-person volunteer role, but many of our other volunteer roles can be uh, virtual, can be adapted to be virtual or hybrid. So I'll hand it back over to Daniela. Thank you, Katya. Yes, so this is a little overview of our volunteer process. Um, as I mentioned, everything really takes place online. You fill out the application after clicking the apply now. Um, there are some questions that are requirements, which have a red asterisk, and there are some questions that are optional. Um, the questions that are optional are usually about which position you want. We give the option to not um, just like choose one just because you can change your mind later on or talk about it in the interview and maybe you want to do something else um, after reviewing all the roles and learning more about um, the interview and what it's going to take. Um, what we do know is that you will have to have some references ready when filling out the application. Um, after the application has been processed and reviewed, you will receive um, an, an interview email and it will tell you all the details on that email um, and by the interview you just re really need to know um, where you can help the most since we are in different offices we want to make sure that we pair you up with the right person um, if the interview process goes well um, then you receive a different email to now create what is called a program volunteer community account. That's what we refer to as our PVC. Um, after creating this account, you will need to be approved to create this account. Um, once you are approved, and then now you can begin your training, which takes approximately four hour, hours long. You don't have to do it all at once. It can be broken up into different days, however you're feeling. Um, at this point, we just suggest a lot of constant communication with what is called your staff partner. That is the person who you will be working with as a volunteer. Um, and then once all your training is done, then you fill out background checks and conflict of interest forms, which are also all online. So there's no fingerprints that are needed. If everything goes well, then you are ready to begin practicing and shadowing as a volunteer with your staff partner. Um, and at this point, I want to share what the form looks like. Let me do that. Um, so this is the form, the volunteer interest application form. This is what I was talking about when it's required. We'll have an asterisk. Then you will have these other um, optional questions. Just if you want to answer them, it will give us more information about why you want to join us, um, where you may want to participate, you know, 
um, our programs and services. It gives a, a, a description of what each of the roles are. Um, also includes advocacy, not just as you know, I mentioned, it's not just a volunteer as a community educator, community uh, representative. We also have an option if you want to do trial match, and then this is where we are at. We are the diversity, equity, and inclusion team. Um, you know, these are just optional um, questions, and then it will give an option as to when you're available to start. Availability, it, does, it doesn't have to be very strict. Obviously, you know, we know our volunteers are giving us a time and we're respectful of that. Um, but we also just want to gauge as to how you're going to be able to help us, where you're standing, and all that good stuff, you know. Um, and then these are just the other required questions that we do ask and want to know about you. Um, as you can see, the form is a little bit lengthier or it looks like it is, but it's really just a few questions that you have to answer. Um, so don't be intimidated by the length of the form. Um, we really just want to get to know you a little bit um, and then we'll just review the information and you just hit submit and you are done. Um, at this point, you will just be waiting for interview times, emails, and um, all the communication. Let me stop sharing. Are there any questions that anyone has? Has a volunteer ever ended up becoming a permanent employee? We do have our Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion present, so I think she is the perfect person to answer this. Stella, can you introduce yourself, please? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Stella, um, and I work with this wonderful team. Thank you for being here today. So to respond to that question, actually, we have had volunteers who have, um, you know, throughout a uh, you know, the association and not only for our own chapter, but throughout the country that at some point, um, you know, do find that there are career opportunities and apply for those. So really depends on on the, you know, the available career opportunities that come up. Um, those are continuously changing. Um, and so, so yes, an answer to that, it's not it's not a, a um, automatic transition. Um, we have, as a volunteer-led organization, um, we certainly have a lot more volunteers than we do staff um, who um, support our work in all um, aspects of our mission. But we have had those opportunities where um, it, is a, it is a match and it is um, an opportunity that presents itself and volunteers, um, you know, choose to apply for those positions. And, and as a result of that, some of those um, volunteers have become employees. We also have the case where um, staff, after they leave for whatever reason, actually become yeah. <laughs> so it works That's true too. It works both ways. That is very true. Yes. Any other questions? No more questions. I did want to get a chance to introduce the rest of the team. Um, this is just where we're at in the Northern California, Northern Nevada chapter. Um, this is our diversity, equity, and inclusion team. We actually did um, only chapter that has a fully staffed diversity and equity team. Um, we are very lucky to have all of us working in this cause. Um, our main offices are in San Francisco, Lafayette in the East Bay, and San Jose. We also have offices in Fresno, Sacramento, um, Reno, I believe. Um, Yes, so this is who we are. This is our team. Um, if you have any questions that you don't want to ask right now or you're wondering later on, you can reach to, out to any of us. We'll be super happy to guide you um, and talk to you about the process. Um, but we really hope that you join us. Our communities need you. We need you. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done still. A lot of people who don't know about us and who are missing out the resources that we have. And you know, we don't want them to think that they're alone because we are here for them. 
And yes, thank you so much for joining us today. We we'll appreciate you. I'll let this play a little bit longer. And thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And I just as a reminder, I put the link. Um, if you are interested in filling out an application, I put that in the chat. And don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.